Hello and welcome to the Smart Divorce Podcast. I'm Tamsin Kane. I will be hosting today. I'm a Chartered Financial Planner working for Smart Divorce and I'm joined by three fabulous experts in the divorce world with me today. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a bit about what they do. So welcome, Sushma, your first time on the Smart Divorce Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Oh, bless you. This is my pleasure. Um... And my background, I think many will know, I used to practice as a divorce lawyer for about 27 years, gave that up over lockdown to set up, um, set up an online holistic family mediation practice. Currently, I'm also doing a, um, a diploma in holistic coaching and mind body practitioner. So I'll be launching um, holistic coaching as well shortly. So that's me. I'm looking forward to this session. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Bit of everything going on with you. And um, we should... We should just say that you've also just launched your book as well. So, um... oh, thank you, Tamsin, for the plug. <laughs> Absolutely, holistic divorce. It's out there now. <laughs> Fantastic, lovely. And Katie, again, a first time on the Smart Divorce podcast. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Katie Harding. I'm I'm an associate solicitor in the family law team at Pennington's Manchester Cooper. And I practice across the whole breadth of family law issues, um, save for public law. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be speaking on the podcast today. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, I was going to say almost an old hand <laughs> now. <laughs> Vicky Richardson, thank you for joining me today. Morning, Tamsin. Morning, ladies. Yes, my name is Vicky Richardson. I am the partner of the Family Law Department in Af Af Africa's Law in Cheshire. And I have been practicing for, it'll be, my silver anniversary this year so um wow. another excuse for a party oh yeah <laughs> definitely or well, any excuse for a party pretty much isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about um adr and whether the solutions via adr are always right or whether sometimes court is the right thing so I'm going to start with you Katie and ask you to tell us a bit about ADR and what it is yep so ADR stands for alternative dispute resolution um, and it encompasses lots lots of different ways for couples to resolve the issues between them um, when they're divorcing um, and the idea is that it keeps it keeps everything out of the court essentially um, so mediation is probably the biggest form of ADR, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more later. There are other methods as well. So there's collaborative law, there's arbitration, but there's also a sort of hybrid where we do it quite often, or I do it quite often in, in my practice, where we might issue court proceedings in order to instigate a court, court timetable. And that's particularly helpful at the moment, given the delays at the courts, but we might run um, and sort of non-court process in parallel. So we might have parties going to mediation alongside that um, because there's nothing preventing you from reaching an agreement um, outside of court, even if proceedings are ongoing. It's just the benefit <clears throat> of kickstarting the court process is that it puts a timetable in place. And that's quite helpful, I think, for clients to give them some structure. It gives them a goal to work towards. Um, there's no obligation on them to see that process all the way through to a final hearing which can be quite a scary thought um, and it also gives them the time to engage in some discussions separately with a mediator for example if if they want to yeah I'm sure perhaps. I can talk lots more about mediation and exactly how that works because I think that probably is the main form of ADR that um that people will have in their mind when they're thinking about non-court um, dispute resolution. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've got, I've got to agree that quite often, you know, even within the mediation process, when clients come directly through to me, as opposed to coming through a lawyer, you know, we do actually have a discussion about, you know, what are the benefits of actually having an application issued alongside dispute resolution? And you're absolutely right, because of the delays in court, there are benefits. And I'm quite often saying it's not, you shouldn't be considered draconian. You know, if you have that timetable in place and actually you then have, I guess, more confidence in the dispute resolution process as well, because you both know that if you're not going to be engaged, fully committed to this, the fallback is the litigation process. I mean, 
the, the vision or the mission, of course, is to stay out of court. Um, and the benefits, you know, I, I would say it's not not just necessarily the legal costs. I, I'm always talking about the emotional costs. I mean, those are, are far greater when we're in the litigation forum, right? But um, I will say that, I, in my view, 25% to 30% cases actually are not going to be suitable for dispute resolution because of the extenuating circumstances. And I think before we started this um, session, we talked about, you know, couples feeling, I guess, a sense of guilt or, you know, we failed because we've not managed to resolve this outside the court forum. But what we want to sort of share with, with those that are listening is actually it's, it's not a failure because in certain instances, you know, for example, if there's severe concerns about transparency in financial cases, you know, in, in the in the mediation forum, I'm not going to carry out a forensic analysis or, or have, you know, the powers to make any sanctions in those cases where there's a severe lack of trust and faith, of course, court is going to be the right approach. And, and, and likewise, where there's severe concerns regarding welfare, safeguarding issues for the children or severe domestic abuse, which is insurmountable, I can't manage or... Um, you know, uh, the power imbalance in those circumstances, it's not always going to be a bar, but, you know, there are a number of cases which have to go down that litigation route. So, yeah, you're right. Mediation ends up being the, the star of the show, because I guess the way the system operates is that the parties have to, unless they're exempt, come for a mediation information assessment meeting with myself. But I do, you know, give the broad spectrum. And actually, in some instances, I have wholeheartedly encouraged arbitration or collaborative because of the parties and um, circumstances. I'm, I'm a very big I'm a very big fan of arbitration um, and certainly alongside the court process so I don't know whether you've done this Katie but I have on a number of cases instigated court proceedings in order to focus the parties on a timetable but there has then been an agreement that because we're going to wait so long for the FDR which is the financial dispute resolution hearing that the parties will go to arbitration and then they have then signed up to the arbitration process um, whereby the, the final decision is binding anyway, and then we have incorporated that into a final consent order as part of the, the financial proceedings. So I think it's important to know that even though you go into the court proceedings, it doesn't stop AVR being a, a possibility. And certainly at the moment, you know, we can wait in Manchester six to nine months for, a, for an FDR hearing for a financial dispute resolution hearing and during all that time the parties are waiting it's emotional it's stressful and I think the waiting time in London is as much as 12 months for such hearings so the advantage as well in that situation of using ADR i.e arbitration are just they're just vast from a monetary emotional stressful point of view. I think I've definitely noticed that, Vicky, and, um, you know, the waiting times are, hu are huge in London, huge backlogs. But what, what I've seen probably more than arbitration, and I would say most of my cases at the moment follow this route, is that people end up paying to have a private FDR. Yeah. So they pay. I, I mean, it, it it's not I wouldn't say it's sort of ADR in the, um, you, you know, classic sense of the word, but um it's it's where parties pay to have a judge basically to and, and they can have that soon at the FDR much sooner by doing that um and again a huge benefit of that is if you're paying for a judge but usually the cost is split equally between you um and you're already more invested in the process because your money's in it you're, you're paying for this judge to give you a whole day of their time um to give you an indication about what the right settlement is in your case so it's a, it's a great way to, to do it it's unfortunate that people are in that position where they're actually having to pay um, for a service that should be provided via the courts and I appreciate that it's not an option that's available to everybody because of the cost but it is a great alternative and I would say the majority of um, financial cases settle at that private hearing or or shortly thereafter um, and actually, one great thing about mediation running alongside that process is, you know, you don't have to try and resolve all of the issues in mediation. You can even just try and narrow the issues so that there are fewer between you. Yeah. That makes the whole settlement process, it just makes it so much easier. And, you know, it, t it takes the heat out of things a bit as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because quite often it's like then we, we're in mediation, there'll be these discrete issues that there's no way 
that there's a huge impasse and obviously I don't have the powers then to jump in and make a judgment or you know a call on it uh, and in those stages I'm, I'm highly in encouraging you know either the arbitration route I mean I guess the benefit of arbitration is if both parties are willing of course there's got to be a willingness it takes two to tango there will be this legally binding outcome right and whereas the alternative um Kate is to what you're saying as opposed to what, what Vicky was sort of advocating is you know that is absolutely brilliant as well it's like an early neutral evaluation with a private FDR but I guess in those cases one party may still not you know take on board what that judge has said is in terms of, of, of a possible outcome and so I guess you know it's, it's just weighing up the pros and cons and what works for the parties but the, the good thing is that we're all recognizing it's not one size fits all and in fact you can collaborate and work and you know go with the flow and just you know experiment and, and sort of test out with clients what may actually work for them mm. depending on their financial circumstances of course because all of these options that we're talking about dispute resolution comes at an additional cost but I, I guess we don't want to forget the fact that going down the litigation route it doesn't necessarily make it any cheaper or emotionally you know less bearing because we know with the delays, inevitably, actually, those costs are going to be a lot higher than perhaps paying for an early private resolution through arbitration or, you know, early neutral valuation or indeed within the mediation forum. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I, Vicky, can I just ask you, because I'm um, just thinking in terms of that most of our listeners are new to this process and may not have a clue what FDR is. Could you just run us through what the court process looks like and, and what an FDR actually is. I was actually, Tamsin, about to say that. And I thought <laughs> we're, we're all we're all talking in very legal terms. And I'm very conscious that people will be saying, what on earth are they talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. So in in a very basic form, either party can apply to the court for the court to become involved in the resolution of financial proceedings after having whether the case is suitable for mediation assessed. So one party can make an application to the court. The court then issues directions which puts the case on a timetable, whereby both parties will exchange their disclosure regarding their financial position. The court will have a, a hearing called the first directions appointment to see any whether any further information is needed. And then the court will list the case for what we call an FDR, and which is what we're talking about now. By the time we get to an FDR hearing, both parties should be fully aware of what each party says are the matrimonial assets. Um, valuations may, may have been obtained with regards to valuations of properties, experts reports in respect of businesses. So ultimately, the court should have a full position of what the matrimonial assets are. The FDR, or the Financial Dispute Resolution Hearing, to give it its official term, is a hearing whereby it's an attempt to resolve matters at that stage. And the idea behind it is that the court, the judge who's hearing the matter in court, will be able to assist the parties in relation to any issues that they have. So the applicant will put forward their case to the judge, the respondent will put forward their case, and the judge loses that time to tell the parties that if he was dealing with it as a final hearing that day, he or she would say, this is how I would look at it. And the parties use that information from the judge to then go back, back out of court and liaise through their lawyers or through each other as to a financial settlement. It's very successful. A lot of cases do settle at that point mm -hmm. because ultimately, if it doesn't, it then progresses to a final hearing whereby the judge will just hear evidence from the parties and make a final decision for them. And that's from a, from a legal point of view as well. And for a party's point of view, that's when your costs really can escalate between the FDR and the final hearing. So the all important hearing from the financial proceedings point of view is the FDR hearing. And a lot of people are just focused on that. As I said earlier, there are massive delays in the court. So parties can be waiting six to nine months is nothing for, to wait for an FDR hearing. And if all the information is available and you're just waiting for a judge to give their impetus on a, on a settlement, then that's when alternative mm -hmm. DR comes in. You can drop out to arbitration, whereby you ask another judge to give a final decision, which is legally binding, or you can agree to just go to mediation, or you can pay a judge, quite often barristers, to sit at a private FDR, whereby you step out of the court system and have a very a very similar FDR hearing in, in a, an independent place. And the barrister or judge at that hearing will give 
the same indication as you would at court process. The difference being, as, Kath, as Katie said earlier, arbitration, the parties sign up to accept that decision. At a private FDR, it's just an indication the parties still don't need to accept it, both of which have costs, but both can be very successful in their own way. And I think it's, you know, each part, it very much depends on the parties and whether you think arbitration or private FDR is suitable. Some some parties need arbitration, some parties need finality and need to sign up for a final agreement. Others, just an indication will help. Mm. And that really, really depends on their personalities, isn't it? And how much trust yeah. and faith they've got in each other. So exactly, so come back to the point of what's going to suit their needs. Um, but yeah, from my experience back in the days as, as, as a family lawyer, that really used to work well. And in fact, mm. most of the cases would settle you know um, at FDR wouldn't they or as we said yeah. through these other um, options that would go for I mean it was very rare certainly from my experience to, to have to go down the full full trial route unless we had those very difficult cases where we needed to get determinations so I think sort of going through the you know having to go through the full court process from beginning to end should really be a last resort for parties if possible um, I think it's a bit of what you said earlier, Sushma, about it being very personality dependent. But I think one thing people should bear in mind about going through the whole court process and just doing it purely that way is that all the decisions ultimately are taken out of your hands, more or less, especially if you get Bingo. final hearing stage. You've got a third party judge who doesn't know you, who doesn't you know, know the ins and outs of your family, who's just got factual financial information before them. Or, or, you know, if it's a children case, they, they've just got the evidence that's before them. They don't know how your family works. Yeah. And they're going to come in and they're going to dictate how you're going to split up your money and how you're going to fund your lifestyle going forward or, or where your children are going to spend their time, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be. And I think for some people, that's probably what they need. You know, if, they, if it's a very... Um, contentious divorce and there isn't a lot yeah. yeah I think you know that's probably a better solution for them they probably need someone to come in and help them but I think for a lot of people um they can have those relatively sensible discussions with the assistance of others mediators and lawyers and things along the way um so that they get to determine what yeah. what, what the outcome is not not somebody else totally agree with you 100% and actually I was thinking that that you know the benefits of actually just staying in control of, of the outcome mm -hmm. and I always highlight that in, in, in mediation whichever dispute resolution option the parties may go for that is one of the key benefits and I will always say you know Katie what you've just said do you really want to give the decision making power over to a bench of magistrates or a district judge that doesn't know you or your children or know, knows about your, your circumstances this is going to allow you to stay in control and it's just empowering them and just keeping in check you know what they are doing by perhaps going down what I mean they may be being egged on by some people you know you take mm. take him or to coat and take them to the cleaners but they're not actually thinking logically so again again coming back to the emotional side of it you know quite often I'm also you know trying to engage them with other you know uh, holistic support uh, counseling therapy coaching because it's really important when they're coming into lawyers or indeed in any dispute resolution forum that they're managing and regulating their emotions so that they can actually think logically and not be, you know, sidetracked or sidelined to going down a different route because staying in control is so important, you know, especially, you know, when it's in relation to our children, we want to make decisions for them. And that's what we're here for, aren't we? We have to take parental responsibility and that's what I'm always encouraging. And again, there's lots of tools and resources for the children arrangements that I will always signpost them off to as well. It, it strikes me as a, as a, non-lawyer <laughs> kind of looking in from the outside that this process this divorce process unless you get all the way through to a final hearing or you choose to go to arbitration essentially this is a negotiation all the way through so whether you go to mediation or whether you use solicitors or use collaborative or even even go through the court process to an fdr there is going to be some sort of negotiation and it is about how soon you come to to a decision. Are there ways that you've found in your practices to make that negotiation happen more smoothly or easier um, for the people who are going through it? I think, I think just, come on, whoever. You know, no, I, I was going to say, I think one of, 
one way to do that is I think first of all as lawyers we have to bear in mind that um, our clients aren't just dealing with the practical aspects of this they are dealing with the emotional side of it as well and we have to be very very aware of that we are not dealing with that um and we have to not lose sight of of the burden that that is upon upon them um so i think sometimes getting the right support in place outside of us is really important and i know tamsin we've and Sushma, we've spoken about it in our separate resolution group about the needs to sort of have a divorce team around you um, whether that's um the support of a therapist or a divorce coach or you know someone advising you about your money and how to deal with it once you are divorced that kind of thing I think that's really important um and it helps I think it it covers all bases for the clients so that they can then when it comes to the negotiations around the finances for example they can sort of put on their um their commercial hat <laughs> to deal with that deal with it a bit more like a a business transaction that sometimes helps mm-hmm whilst they've still got the emotional support from the relevant people in the background. Yeah. I think I think you're right, Katie, there about emotion, you know, our clients being emotional and it's very important for us to remember that. Mm-hmm. A lot of my clients will say to me, and I'm sure you probably get the same, it's not the mediation process. It's not even the going to court, it's seeing them or mm-hmm. from the mediation point of view, um, having to sit, I know there's different forms of mediation, but basically having to sit in the same room as them and discuss you know, the issues that probably led them to separate in the first place and try and leave the emotion out the door because Sushma, I presume that's very difficult for you at some time to try and help yeah. the parties reach a point where they can chat about it objectively. Yeah, absolutely. So so just coming on to that point that, yeah, that, that is the key. The key is that, you know, when, when, when couples are separating, and I guess that's the whole, you know, um, for me, the book has come out on holistic divorce to sort of remind people it's not just about your legal rights and responsibilities. Actually, you know, when when you are facing um, divorce and separation, we have to look at it holistically. You know, mind, body, spirit, and soul, and the emotional side of it, the psychological um, perspective is so important. And and even when they're in mediation, you're right, we're carrying out a risk analysis, a safeguarding check. And you know, I've I've kind of coined the term. From my own personal experience that divorce is a living bereavement divorce and separation so you're going through the cycle of emotions that you would do when you're facing a bereavement although you have closure there you have a last rites a burial in divorce you, you don't and so i do have to look at where the parties are and, and quite often with the best feeling in the world they might want to mediate but emotionally i mean i had one of those cases just recently you know on the face of it, there were no red flags. This would have been a, a safe um, and suitable case for mediation. But one of the parties was so emotional. There's no way they could deal with this. And I was signposting and saying, look, at the moment, this is not the right time to mediate because you need to, you know, regulate your emotions. And that's where counselling, coaching, you know, psychotherapy comes in. Um, and so as lawyers, we've just got to be so mindful of where are they along the journey? Can they think clearly? Or are they, you know, making irrational decisions? So it's having that holistic approach, which is really, really important and getting, as you said, the right team around you. But sadly, not everyone can afford that, right? But there's lots of tools and resources, so many tools and resources, you know, so even if you can't afford it, you know, just coming back to looking after your mental health and well-being, you know, getting in touch with mother nature, breath work, you know, doing yoga within your own household and these are simple tools and resources that I try and share with people just to say look look after yourself before you start jumping in down the legal route you know and and and, and so yeah I, I kind of agree that it's kind of just taking that holistic approach to to what what, what our clients are going through it's not an easy road to travel no, by any. absolutely and there's I think an important thing to to say about that is that yes not of course not everybody can afford to have a a full team of people but sometimes it can be lower cost in the long run to have the right people around you and helping you to make make the right decisions as you go along rather than um rather than going all the way to a to a final hearing and 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 through that without the right support in the background Um, um i was i was just thinking actually with regards to adr um, these serious delays that we're having at the court at the moment um, are 
majorly, they weren't great before COVID, but certainly as a result of COVID, that's what we're suffering. So as I said previously, you could be waiting for six to nine months for an FDR hearing. That's really frustrating for the parties when everybody's ready to go. And um, my view is that in a certain extent, that has helped and developed other forms of ADR because I can now sell it to parties. Look, you're going to wait six, six months to have this hearing in front of the judge. Why don't we have a private FDR whereby you can get that information from a judge in four weeks time and might hopefully reach a settlement or even go off to the arbitration track and have it sorted so much sooner. So I think, you know, in a certain extent, these delays can help us um, in a positive way. Whereas previously, I think that once the parties were in the court proceedings, they were stuck there and they were just tunnel vision towards the hearing and you would get the hearing date through much more quickly. So I think that is one positive thing from COVID, if there has been any. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of the silver linings that I agree. I think there's definitely more push towards a dispute resolution. And actually, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know whether it's because of the connections I've got within the legal world, but, you know, I do find that, you know, people would have thought, well, you're crazy during lockdown, you're giving up, you know, your dream job, and you're setting up this mediation service. Um, but yeah, I, I found that you know, work has been coming in and it's increasing. And I do think that's timing and, and where we are in the world with, you know, the, the backlog and in, in, in a chaos in, in the court system that previously lawyers may not have wholeheartedly encouraged dispute resolution, but now they're recognizing, you know, we've got to work together in a more collaborative fashion, creative fashion, because that is in our client's best interest, you know, being stuck in delays it's not serving anybody you know not the parties not their children if it's children because you know that's really having a, an adverse impact on on their emotional psychological well-being so yeah I agree with you Vicky um, I, I guess Katie would would also agree with that I, I do agree and I think what you said there about having to work together is really important and it's, and it's also worth worth bearing in mind when you're you're going through a divorce is that it's not just it doesn't have to be just one or the other so um, I know I said that at the very, very beginning, but I what I what I wanted to make the, the point about really was that if you are mediating, um, you're not mediating in a vacuum. So you can come back to your lawyer and you can tell them about your mediation discussions, yeah. all of which are are confidential discussions that that you're having. Um, um, you shouldn't feel pressured to commit to anything in mediation. Um, and you can speak to your lawyers about, you know, perhaps once you've exchanged the form E, which um, we referred to earlier, which is a long document um, whereby you each exchange fi your financial information so you can work out what's actually in the marital pot to be divided. Um, you can go back to your, your lawyers, perhaps once you've exchanged that in mediation to see whether there's any other questions that you need to raise or whether any experts need to be instructed to provide a report on perhaps how pensions need to be divided, for example. Um, and then you can go back to the next mediation session, progress things a little bit further, and then again, come back to your lawyer, perhaps talk about settlement discussions that you've had in mediation. So um, <clears throat> it all kind of you know, like Sushma was saying about it being a holistic experience, I think that's a really important point for people to understand. It's not just one or the other. Mm. Everyone should be working together. So you're not sort of flying solo once you're in mediation and expected to figure everything out by yourselves. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it's wholeheartedly <laughs> encouraged. You know, all mediators should be saying, you know, certainly when it, what, you know, when it comes to disclosure, like I, we, we mirror what lawyer-led negotiations do or what a court would expect so you know you could only do financial mediation if there is that voluntary agreement to exchange disclosure but you're absolutely right there is always a push go and take financial advice go and take you know legal advice before the next session because you want to be informed because you can only make decisions that are going to serve you and your children if you're going to take some additional support from as we just said the group of other people around you whether it's your financial planner and it sometimes is your financial planner your accountant and your lawyer yeah. You know, ultimately and because then they can come back armed with that information and then they can then take the dialogue further so yeah it's always encouraged and I know I you know will work with I mean mine's is a private service but there are sometimes families who can't afford to you know take advice throughout the process but there are certain interjections I'll say okay you don't have to formally have a lawyer on record but from time to time it's going to be so important that you do 
you know yeah. and, and, and now nowadays you don't have to have you on record fully because I know that we can have those um practices where you know they'll come and see you as and when they need to like as you go you're not formally on record for them mm. but you're in the background and so mm. I encourage that and again you know Tamsin in terms of you know what you offer you know financial uh, planning and guidance on you know the net impact of any proposals it's so important for me as a mediator to flag that up that that is a tool that's a resource and it'll be invaluable because then you know what this means to you because the net outcome and also putting where your money where your mouth is all well and good making proposals but if you can't actually follow them through so that's where we will kind of fit in and so it's just sort of giving that you know a guidance to the clients so that they can then hopefully make their own decisions and then you know at the end of it in mediation as we all know there's no legal outcomes that's when they're coming back to the lawyers to have you know court orders prepared to ratify and get that finality get that closure absolutely i think um I have had parties as well and cases whereby I've attended mediation and the other party's lawyer has attended mediation and we've had a round the table mediation session and managed to reach an agreement that way because I quite often find so many clients say to me, can you come with me? Can you come with me? And I'm like, no, not at this stage, but maybe later down the line I can. And just, you know, when they get to a certain point, quite a lot of clients will feel better if they have the solicitor there with the mediator so that whatever decision is potentially reached, they can discuss it with their solicitor before actually agreeing to it. And I think that is very useful as well. Mm. I think that's the hybrid model that you, you're talking about, hybrid yeah. mediation. And so there are some mediators who have, have gone on, on and taken on that additional, I guess, string to their bow. I haven't haven't gone to that stage at this, at this stage of my career. It's something that I'm, I may think about doing. But again, this is why it's so important to know what you need as a client and I make it very clear from the outset that I'm a traditional mediator mine's is the traditional model I don't offer shuttle mediation and I, I don't offer hybrid but if that's what you're going to want then you know there are other services out there mm. and so Vic it's good to bring that up to the audience's I guess knowledge that you know if they are looking for a dispute resolution option mediation there are different ways and hybrid does work and it's as long as they've got I guess the financial capacity because that's quite often people are coming to mediation because they're trying to keep the cost down and so I guess if they're including their lawyers but there are plenty of you know cases and clients where you know money is no objective and actually it's going to serve them to go down that route so yeah um well to point out absolutely there's just one thing we are we're getting towards the end of our time together but there is just one thing that I wanted us to talk about because it's something that is often asked of me when people come to see me and and we've talked about the fact that this process is a negotiation unless you get all the way down to the final hearing or or through to arbitration and that's entitlement so as in, what am I entitled to? So there's a wry smile from me, <laughs> from me ladies now. Uh, I'm going to pass this to you, Vicky, because I feel like you're going to have something useful to say. <laughs> <laughs> Think before I answer. <laughs> um, I think the first question the main question that myself and Kate are always asked in an initial meeting with a client is what am I going to get what am I entitled to is she going to take me to the cleaners anything similar to that really and our stock answer will always be I don't know yet because I don't have all the financial information but years of experience will give you an idea of which way it will go um and you know and until we know what the financial situation is from both parties and what's in the matrimonial part we can only then discuss discuss what you're quote entitled to unquote um or as we as we prefer to call it a reasonable settlement <laughs> i suppose very broadly speaking very very broad brush is that a starting point would be that there will be an equal division of the matrimonial assets but there are lots of factors that might influence whether that falls you know one side or the other of 50 percent um and you know some of those factors are how long you've been married for for example or you know what your needs are as opposed to the other person's needs for example there's there are so many mm. things to think about but as Vicky said until you've actually got some kind of disclosure in front of you it's very hard to say you know it's very hard to assign a figure to what to what that's going to be and I mean, that's the financial side. There's also the children side, because I get lots of clients coming in saying, you know, well, are the children going to have to spend 50% of the time 
uh, between us? Are they going to have to split their time equally? What's it going to look like? And that's a slightly different answer, I think, because that's very much led by what's in the best interest of the children. And that's that's how a, a court would approach it. That's their paramount consideration. And that's how we have to look at it as well. And how, how any sort of third party that's involved in that sort of decision should be considering it. So that that becomes very subjective. Every child is completely different and what that child needs is completely different. Um, and we have to work with our clients to understand their children a bit and what their needs are um, to come to some sort of sensible suggestion as to how their time should be divided and you know where they're going to live and who they're going to spend time with. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you in terms of, you know, what you've just said as a starting positions in relation to both, you know, finance and children and within mediation, of course, all mediators have to bring to the participants attention the backdrop of the law so you know quite often we will start off by looking at the section uh, 25 criteria in relation to what the courts will look at in relation to finances and that's um, again I forget the audience will think what you're talking about the matrimonial <laughs> causes act 1973 which of course governs finances um, and with children proceedings yeah I will always talk about you know the heart of the children Act 1989 is of course you know what's going to be in the best interest of your children um, and ultimately just encouraging them to sort of dig deep and really put themselves in their children's you know shoes as opposed to what mum would like what dad would like they're not mm -hmm. a commodity you know I have to make that very clear this whole talk about you know 50 50 split even that terminology I'm, I'm kind of sort of trying to reframe that and saying yeah. you know you can have a shared care in place it may not be an equal you know time what's going to work for little joey you know, so it's basically putting ourselves into to their shoes and being very mindful of what's going to serve them. Financially, will we say, don't we, that, you know, English law, there's a huge wide discretion. I mean, that's why people come here to the UK. There's no formulaic approach. So it's very complex. But there are, as you say, you know, once we've got the full disclosure in place, various factors that one or the other can put forward to the court to, to move away from that initial starting position of, of an equal, you know, share of the assets, because it's about meeting their fundamental needs first and foremost to have two households as starting point. And then if there's excess, of course, then, then we're looking at that. Um, I think it just also in terms of the children's side of things, there's also child inclusive mediation. And Sushma, you probably can talk a bit more to, about this than I can, but yeah. that's where a, a specially trained mediator will speak to the children as well. So yeah. that they're they're in, they feel involved in the process and their views can be um, taken into consideration more directly rather than us all just assuming <laughs> what the children Absolutely. want, and what we think the children want. Yeah. And I, it's not something I've come across a lot so far. And I yeah. don't think there are huge numbers of child inclusive mediators around, but it is it is an option. It, it is. And again, we're encouraging or, or we've been asked to sort of encourage and promote that to those um, couples who've got children, I'd say, 10 years plus, because that, that's a typical age for the child's voice to be heard within the mediation process. And it's kind of trying to mirror and, and I guess, take away some of the slack from the court. So, you know, wishes and feelings report that the, the welfare officer uh, would do within in, within the court proceedings I guess it's trying to mirror that through a child inclusive mediator again I've chosen not to you know take on that additional um, string to my bow but I you know can and do know of mediators who offer that service and where it's required I will of course co-work with the mediator who can see the child and then um, bringing the child's you know views to the mediation forum how that works in practice is both parents firstly got a consent quite often that's where the downfall is. One parent saying, you know, reason why we're in mediation is, is that I want us to take responsibility. I want, I don't want the kids to be engaged in this. I want us to sort of focus and try and deal with it. So that's why it's very, it, from my experience, very rare. You know, I've only, I think from my experience, since I've been a mediator, there's been two cases. And that was earlier on in my mediation career about a decade ago, where we had child inclusive mediation, right? Um, but there is that option, you're absolutely right, where the child's voice can be heard and it can be invaluable, you know, because quite often that's what both the parents want. You know, you're saying one thing, I'm saying one thing. Um, and then it's like, well, actually, let's hear from our, our, our daughter or our son. 
um, and have that. But again, the child has got to be in agreement, right? You can't just say to a child, yeah. you know, you're going to have a session with a mediator. So the, the child inclusive mediator in an appropriate way will make contact with the child. If the child is then wanting to have their voice heard, it's a separate, you know, private confidential session with the child and the mediator. They're not going to breach any confidences. And sometimes from my from my understanding of child inclusive mediators, Children will like to, you know, offload or, you know, explain to a third party neutral how they're feeling, but they don't actually want all of that going back to mum and dad. Mm. So, you know, there could be scenarios where not much is being fed back to mum and dad because that mediator's got to hold confidence, right? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. But it is an option. Ladies, thank you so much. We have sadly come to the end of our time together already. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, your contact details are all in our show notes. If anybody wants to get in touch with uh, any of you, I'm sure that you'll be delighted. Um, and thank you for listening today and hope you can join us for our next episode.